to Module 3, the British Invasion. The British are coming, the British are coming. Uh, the Beatles, of course, initiated the British Invasion in uh, 1965. Half the number one hit songs were British. And there are two kinds of British bands, the softer, refined, less rebellious, and the harder, raw, rocking band. And the Beatles are more of the more refined, less rebellious one. And, of course, the Rolling Stones are more of the hard rock, rocking band. And in a lot of ways, the kind of the fans would ask, you know, are you a Beatle or are you a Stone? And many trends after '64 went either behind the Beatles or the, or the, or the, or the Rolling Stones. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, about the Rolling Stones in, in detail. Uh, a couple of years before the Satisfaction came out, uh, originally called himself the L Little Blue Boy, and the Blue Boys, uh, Mick, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, and eventually they came up with the Rolling Stones from a Muddy, Su Muddy Waters uh, song, and. So Muddy Waters, of course, was this blues musician, rhythm and blues musician, and it really shows how much blues music had an influence on the Rolling Stones. And in a lot of ways, when we had the Beatles coming over, they brought back rock and roll to America. Uh, and Rolling Stones, they, they studied the, the music, the, these Chicago blues musicians, and they loved this music, and they put that into the, the music when they were originally playing. So uh, if you, if you want to come on is, is a Chuck Berry cover, and then uh, I Want to Be Loved is a Willie Dixon cover you can check out by the Rolling Stones and see how they sound on there. Um, basically, you hear the, the influence of the blues music. You hear those bends going on there. You hear that Chuck Berry playing uh, that's going on there. Uh, Jones, Jaggers, Richards, uh, Bill Wyman, drummer Charlie Watts, uh, Ian Stewart are the original members of the uh, uh, Ian Stewart, original members of the Stones. Uh, Begin is a British blues band that covered Chicago blues records uh, on there. And they, basically, Beatlemania was everywhere. Uh, so they decided to get rid of their suits and just appear in street clothes, and that's pretty much the, the way they wanted to, to rock out, anyways. Uh, I Want to Be Your Man rose to number three in 63. Uh, and in 64, they had basically a counter image to the Beatles with more suggestive stage acts, more of a rebellion, menacing look. Toured the U.S. and Canada. And, and they were popular in the big cities like New York or L.A., but, but the smaller ones, you know, they were playing to, to empty crowds, basically, in a lot of ways. And so they knew they had to come back and tour over and over and over again. Second time is more successful and so forth like that. And on the Ed Silver show, the audiences uh, tore up the studio as they perform. And, and, you know, that doesn't happen too much today anymore. Uh, he also imitated dance forms uh, and moves from a lot of the from James Brown, some, some of the great acts, uh, uh, Motown acts, and some great uh, soulful acts as well. On there, so a couple songs like "Time Is On My Side," 1964. Yeah, how is how is this different than, than the Beatles? How is this similar to the Beatles? And you hear that inspired blues guitar playing. So you know, whenever you hear the, the bends going on. <laughs> You hear that? You hear that blues music going on uh, with that in there. Definitely inspired by by blues music in a, in a great deal. Uh, Satisfaction in 1965. Of course, this becomes a really major hit. In a, in a lot of ways, in contrast to the Beatles, their vocal style is a little more harsh and raspy, and not a little pop influence. You get that that riff going on, going on, on and that riff. And what a riff is is a repeating pattern over and over and over again. So if I were to repeat a pattern, that's a repeating pattern. And I can use that over and over again. So I do day tripper there. That's a repeating pattern of nah, I'm trying to think of some other ones. So there's a, there's a lot of repeating patterns going on. And those are riffs. Riffs that are used over and over and over again. That's a riff. That's a riff. Uh, a riff can be played on any instrument. Now, a lot of times, on, mainly on guitar, or piano, and bass, but they, they play potentially on any instrument as well. Satisfaction went to number one in '65. Controversy over the lyrics, some double entendres uh, about you know, what kind of satisfaction are they talking about on uh, there? And again, this is 1965, and America was still pretty conservative in their values and, and, uh, and their, their morals at this point here. So. Um, and, 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 and so you know, some other ones, like, let's spend the night together, definitely a lot more over the top as well. They, uh, one of my favorite tunes from the Rolling Stones, actually maybe one of my favorite ones in a lot of ways,
is, is uh, Moses' little helper. And if you read the lyrics to that, you know, what a drag it is getting old. And, and, and kids are different today. I hear every mother say, mother needs something today to calm her down. And although she's not really ill, there's this little yellow pill. She comes running from the shelter of mother's little helper. And in there, you know, what's the song talking about? Drugs amongst the past generation and the satisfaction of society and the mundanity of life as an adult going on. And again, this is, this, this is a, in a song. So are they talking about like the, the drug use that is currently going on in the 60s? Um, is, there, is there sort of a, um, is it fair that, you know, you go to a doctor and get this and, and, and you can't get it if you're a kid? I, 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 and these are some things you can, you can talk about, think about as well. Uh, Altamont, uh, we'll get to that. Basically, uh, they had this tour and they wanted this really nice ending to this, this tour. And they basically wanted to do a, a Woodstock of, of the West Coast. And uh, sadly, they invited the Hells Angels to uh, uh, be bouncers at it for security. And, and sadly, uh, someone died in there. And, and, and bands kept on playing just so that the crowd wouldn't go too crazy and whatnot like that. So, um, Sympathy for the Devil, that they didn't play that record for a long time after that. And in some ways, this, this kind of begs the question, does music affect the behavior? Uh, it, some say yes, some say no uh, on there. Uh, some other songs, like Angie's a good example of a little bit more of a, of a, of a softer type sound in there. Do you hear some blues? Do you hear some riffs in there? If you listen to that. And if you go through and listen to a song um, like Brown Sugar, and this was like in 1971. Uh, if you go through, read through the lyrics of that, what's the song about? And is this song about, is, is it to justify their bad boy image? Uh, are they really misogynistic? Or are they, is this part of their bad boy image? And if, if it's so, uh, is it, is it justify the lyrics? So these are some questions you can ask yourself. And a lot of times I like to ask the, the folks in class, do you actually listen to the lyrics that you're, you're dancing to or you or the music you're supporting? And if, if, if so, there are lyrics you don't agree with, you know, why, why are you listening to that music? Is, is it the beat or what is it about that? And a lot of times you just can't, you don't understand because the words go by so quickly you're not actually understanding what the lyrics is. But if you go through and read through Brown Sugar, you probably heard that a, a, a lot of times and you actually look at the lyrics like, ooh, oh my. Check it out, check it out and see what you think. Uh, the Bad Boys of Rock, in a lot of ways, they're the first rock group to foster this overly negative image through personal lives and through outrageous antics of the fans. Uh, they all had various drug charges and arrests throughout their uh, career. Transformed the 60s from this kind of this peace love generation to more of a more violent drug oriented one. And the most rebellious, antisocial, hedonistic side of rock in some ways. And they kind of had this path where rock would lead to the hard rock of the 70s, the punk rock, uh, some of the heavy metal in the 80s, and, and maybe even the gangster rap uh, in, the, in the 90s. So are you a Beatle or are you a Stone? Uh, the, they, they pretty much, the focus was between one or the other. The Stones were interested in rhythm and blues at first, and then when they, they basically had more of a mainstream um, rock and kind of more poppy sound when they actually wrote their own songs. The Beatles took out new territory and new uh, variants of rock and roll wherever they went and pushed the boundaries. And the Beatles were the group and the Stones were the challengers and they were je jealous as well as a lot of other bands for them. And the, the Rolling Stones tried to copy them and sometimes they were successful, sometimes they weren't. I got some other British bands up here uh, that are just kind of neat to talk about just so you can see the, the variety of them. The Dave Clark Band, um, maybe catch us if you can, is really one of the Searchers, Needles and Pins. Uh, Jerry and the Peacemakers, Don't Let the Sun Catch, catch You Crying. Uh, there's a beautiful story to that one if you go read that on Wikipedia. Uh, Herman's Hermits, I'm Into Something Good. Ho the Hollies, Carrie Ann. The Animals, House of the Rising Sun. The Kinks, You Really Got Me. And, uh, zombies, the, the, the Time of the Seasons. Um, and so forth. And, and with this here, with these British bands coming over, a lot of the American bands, these garage bands come out. And one that pops to mind is the Kingsman and Louie Louie. And just for grins, I'll, I'll throw this out. Go find the original copy of it if you have it. Uh, you probably find our recording on YouTube as well. And listen to it about, uh, about a minute into it, something like that, a minute and a half into it, something like that. Um, basically, they were, uh, the FBI was doing um, research 
uh, on this record, found out it's obscene. And they listened to it over and over again, and they put out, well, this song has, makes no sense, so therefore it can't be submersive. However, about a minute into it, the drummer drops his uh, drumstick, and they basically had $80 to record this song, and they couldn't stop. And I, the drummer drops his drumstick and yells out the F word. And you can hear it clear as a bell in there. So for the last umpteen years, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the radios, the waves, on your radios, you can, you've been hearing that all throughout, which I find is fascinating. The, the, the FBI couldn't find it, but it's there clear as a bell. There actually was a cuss word, a naughty word in there. Uh, well, anyways, Rolling Stones and the British Band's uh, revival, uh, most of these musicians come from uh, really poor musicians and, and, and uh, I mean poor people, poor backgrounds and so they had a lot to draw upon and these garage bands you, you go out there you, you're playing music because you want to play music and a lot of these British bands did the same thing they wanted to make music and go out there and do the style of music they wanted to do and it changed the world and it changed rock and roll 